The Searchers, welcome to Gold. It's great to see you both. Frank Thank and you John. Very much. It's very good to be here. Yep. We've uh, never been here before. Okay, great to see you. Listen, you're heading out on tour from April to June and you're doing 28 dates. Tell us first why you felt you had to go back on the road after what's been like a four-year layoff. And it's the thank you tour, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, what happened, we, we actually decided to retire in uh, 2019, March the 31st, 2019. You know, we'd been touring con consistently for over 60 years. And it just was, uh, the fun was beginning to go out of it. So we had the rest. Then COVID hit. So we stopped at the right time because there was a lot of things to organise to to um, halt the whole process. So And uh, you couldn't do anything anyway. So that was great. But then uh, we got the pressure to maybe do one last tour to thank the people. And we said, OK, we'll do that. And that was a 48-day tour, um, which yeah. is just a walk in the park for us because we did 200 shows every year. And that was just normal. So there was nothing hard about 48 days. And that was going to be it. But it turned out to be incredible fun. I mean, we're, I think it shocked all of us at the, how well we got on and what fun the whole thing was. And it was a huge success. And the last night in Liverpool at the Philharmonic was epic. Oh. I don't think there's any other way to describe it. It was the most, uh, probably the most memorable <laughs> concert in our career, I think, that one. That is um, really the place for you to finish a tour, It was. It? We're, yeah, that was supposed to be it, end in Liverpool. Now we've got on to this other thing, so we're not, we've done our ending in Liverpool, but now we've still gone on. Maybe we should have stopped there, but, you know, there were places we didn't do, and they said, well, you know, Scotland, Scotland went Scotland on about, you don't did. come up to Scotland, so anyway, we're doing it, and we're going to have fun, and it's going to be a huge success and great. Now, you're a band who really got your experience playing live, you know, um, playing gigs like the Beatles. You went to Hamburg in the early 60s. The Star Club, yeah. And you played at the Star Club. You know, what are your memories of, of, of those days? And what, why did you go to Hamburg? Why did you well, feel as a band money. you had to go? <laughs> For money, basically, yeah. They paid great money in, in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, um, I'm Daddy and the seniors went over there and they said that was great, you know, they paid great money. And then Horst Fascher came over to Liverpool looking for bands and uh, he picked the Beatles and ourselves and uh, went over there and we couldn't believe how great it was. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> and we also wow. played with all our idols like Fats Domino, Jerry Lee, Gene Vincent, the Everleys. So it was an experience Ray for Charles us. Ray Charles you worked with? Yeah, he was there. Yeah, that's I'd... where I met them. And how many but... shows a day did you play there? Uh, depending on how many bands they're on. Whoever's on, plus the uh, mega star, yeah. uh, we just alternate. You normally, normally five, six, or three. Yeah, well, you normally always do three shows, and then if you'd gone done an early show in the afternoon, the f beginning of the late afternoon, they started about four o'clock. Um, then you'd end up doing a very late show as well, an early morning show. So it could be four. It was quite hard work, but they did pay good money. I bought my first car out of Hamburg. <laughs> now, America. I want to talk to you about America. How was it for the searchers heading for the States? Because you were all young lads, you know, and there you were, part of the British invasion, and it must have been just amazing. Well, we went up. over just after the Beatles did the Ed Sullivan show. Mm. 64, I think. Mm, March 64. Yeah, mm. and uh, we followed into them to do the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, what was that like? Oh, unbelievable. It was fantastic. We were, we were that in all. We, we sat in our rooms ordering... <laughs> room service, huge apple pies and cream, and it was terrible. <laughs> Everything we used, you'd like what you do. I mean, we're young lads and we were ordering all kinds, but right. to see New York and be on the telly, we just take, couldn't take it all in. This is what I wanted to ask you about the gigs at the Brooklyn Fox. Oh, the, the club with uh, Marvin Gaye and yeah. Martha Reeves. Frank will tell you about oh, that. that. Yeah, that, I'll tell Spring. you the whole lineup. Actually, it was the Fox Theatre. This was the beginning of that '64 tour. In uh, it went started in New York, went across the states, a few gigs. Then we picked up other people in um, Los Angeles to go on to New Zealand and Australia. And we were headlining mm. that tour. We went the the New York part of it was. Um, a week of shows at the Fox Theatre in Brooklyn, six shows every day. They started at 10 in the morning and they finished at 10 at night. <laughs> and that's how they did their shows. Uh, it was nothing unusual. And we being part of the British invasion, we were like the big stars at that time. So the bill, with us at the top of the bill, was Searchers, Dusty Springfield, Millie, Marvin Gaye, um, 
Martha and the Vandellas, the Supremes, Smokey and the Miracles, the Contours, the Temptations, Little Anthony, the Ronettes, the Shangri-Las, the Dovells, Jane and the Americans and the New Beats. Yeah, how, how did you get on with all, with all the Motown stuff? Fantastic. Stars? Yeah. yeah, they were great. Yeah, they, they were they were so pleased that we'd brought their attention because they weren't really considered that hot in New York. They, they were so used to them. Um, in the daytime, all through the daytime, we were like the big kiddies. The kids would queue around the block to get into this thing. At nighttime, it was more or less at the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock shows, it was Marvin Gaye's time and he was the big star, um, you know, for his kind of audience and... Uh, but it was it was wonderful. It was, meeting them was great. They weren't. I, no one was not nice to us. I remember talking to the Temptations particularly, and they they're just lovely people. You and guys uh, were was us doing sugar and spice. <laughs> <laughs> well, headlining the show. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. Actually, strangely enough, our biggest hit in America didn't come till a year later, because mm. um, uh, Love Potion Number no. Nine had been on the first album which has uh, been released before we even did those shows. And then a, a freak thing, someone released it in November of 65, I think it was, and it went to number three in the charts. And uh, not to us, we didn't have any way of making capital out of that. Oh, money. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I saw that song was your biggest American hit. Yeah, yeah it's strange. It's still Just one of the most popular the ones. Mm, yeah, it, even today, it's like, I remember it more than most of our other songs. Yeah, needles and pins was your your second number one. How, how did how did it come about? To how, how come you picked needles and pins? Well, we we nicked it actually from Cliff Bennett and the Rebel well, we Rousers. We nicked it from Jackie Deshannon. Yeah, <laughs> so um, we were sitting watching Cliff on. I think they were on on one of the late sessions, and he did. Um, I think they did. We said, "You did." There she goes. Yeah, she you did the that. Cliff tones. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, and, and then you did needles and pins, and we were sitting there, and Chris, our drummer, we were going, "Hmm." That this is a this good song, this, you know. Mm. So we talked about it, but with Cliff having brass in the band, we th that, that's not right, you know, blah, blah. So we started, got, got the words off by the Franco or Cliff, and we, we nicked it, basically, and uh, we did it. <laughs> well, it was there for anyone to say. We, we'd actually already taken it from Jackie DeShannon, whose record yeah. hadn't done anything. Mm. And as John said, we were a big band with saxes, tenor saxes in harmony, and I've still got a bootleg of us doing that at a club in Hayes, Middlesex. And it really is... Awful. It was never a hit the way we did it, <laughs> I've got to tell you. And the searchers had their skill was look at... We used to, with Cliff Bennett, we used to take the songs and try and do them exactly as they were on the original record. Searchers very wisely didn't do that. They took the song, they stripped it down and found the good bits and made the most out of that. And it was much better as a guitar song, didn't want need the saxes at all. And they all the complicated arrangement at the end, they removed that totally, repeated the good bits that were in there, and there you've got a number one. We could never have done that. We didn't yeah. have that kind of imagination. The strange so. thing about it is the uh, needles and pins, uh, yeah. which people picked up on me. Just the way Scousers sing. <laughs> I remember having that. Uh, my mum had the old pie of 45 oh, of needles yeah. and pins. Yeah. Yeah, goodness. Yeah. Brilliant. How was it recording these songs back in the 60s? You know... I think I read something like the Trogs recorded a wild, wild thing and with a girl like you as part of a 45-minute recording session. Surprised yeah, it yeah, took yeah. them that long. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't be cruel. No, you, you had a time limit on everything. Three hours was a general yeah. session and you were expected to do an A-side and a B-side side side. in that time. Yeah. That their first album, your first album was done in an evening, wasn't it? <laughs> all of it. Meet the search was done all around two mics uh, on our way to, to Germany. And uh, wow. when we come back, it was done. <laughs> we had to buy ourselves out of the contract in Germany to come back to promote them. All oh, right, really? <laughs> it's, it's just it's all, a, all happens. It you was don't, you very don't know. different from the way things yeah. are done today. Today, yeah. I mean, the money and the scale of everything has changed because kids go it, they don't see themselves as making a little bit of success and going around doing the ballrooms. They see X Factor and they see themselves making it and they start off on arena tours and they do as well. <laughs> And also they have, and all, they have all the materials, all, all, all the things all they the can buy as recording. They can sit in the studio and in, in the home and do yeah, all the Everything's designed, they have a corporation behind them and that's the way to do it. I look at Lippa in Liverpool, yeah. young kids coming out. Of, I mean, I got two painters around the other day, Price Up, students from Peyton, and one of the daughters was at Lippa. 
and she, she showed me the video of the, the daughter playing guitar and singing her own songs. I said, and, and they've got their own recordings gear. Unbelievable. But yeah. everyone starts at a different level, didn't they? When we started out, out in as teenagers, all we had was skiff, skiffle to go by to learn a few chords. Mm, cause still the same. No one knew about guitars before that. So move on a, a couple of decades and the people that started then had people like Clapton and everyone else and the Beatles to follow, so their playing started at that level. Now they, they're way, way above. Everything is so professional these days and uh, and the rewards come to them as well. I, know, but I still searching. think there's probably shifty stuff going on, but who knows? <laughs> there's always, there was an article, was a Bucks Fizz on the Sunday paper. Oh, they were doing, yeah, I saw that. Jay Aston was... Jay Aston was making more money with Fizz than she did with That's Bucks right. Fizz. So, I mean, usual story. I mean, we, we knew the, the New Seekers years ago as well. They were telling their stories about... Mm. Fine. That we can we have? They they were on wages, and they had to pay for their own hotels and things like that. What? That's <laughs> like well, it's the price of an education, isn't yeah. it? Now you can't. Yeah, there's no point in being bitter about it all your life because no. you just not do yourself. All. You know, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's be bitter. Yeah. No, you, you guys got the experience through yeah, playing yeah, live. You learn by it. Yeah, it's it's just. Part well, she's and part right because we made more in the last um, twenty or thirty years than we ever made in the early yeah. days. Oh, mm. well, it was, the, the royalties were so bad. Yeah. So really, I mean, bad. You know, it's like half, half, half a penny between the five We had a lot of back, <laughs> back in the 60s, did you ever, you know, around when Mersey Beat was really booming and, and the Beatles were and yourselves were having massive hits, did you all run into each other on, on the tour? Oh, yeah. On the tour, oh, yeah, so. I mean, uh, I, I, when we were doing the Beatles stuff, we were going around all the clubs, like going down the cavern, We'd be carrying our gear down the stairs, the cavern. They'd be bringing theirs up and be like, you know, we'd off to our bit of and baths. <laughs> but after we had the hits, of course, we'd see them either on TV shows or as part of packages well, the and M1 things calf. like that. Hmm? Well, the M1 calf. The M1, oh yeah, the Blue Ball <laughs> Cafe on the M1. Yeah, used to. It was great, great days. Because yeah. when you and you toured from London, you met by Madame Tussauds. Yeah, yeah, all sort of place. I mean, yeah, all Everyone. in a big money, minibus. And, and you, you could go park off. your car there. <laughs> leave your car. <laughs> leave your car by Baker Street and go on tour. My, how things have changed. <laughs> could you tell, back then in, like, 63, could you tell the Beatles were going to be absolutely massive? Yes, uh, when, when we... When we... When I first saw the Beatles, it was St John's Hall, a bootle in Liverpool, and I was uh, coming home in the, in, on the bus... And the bar, we should buy the local Echo and see it was on with us tonight at the uh, St. John's Hall. And it said the Silver Boot Beatles, mm. House Germany. I thought, what the bloody hell is this? You know, it's like, <laughs> so when I got there, um, first of all, went backstage and there was Lennon uh, having a fight with some bloke. I don't know what that was all about. And then the, we did our bit. We, we were dressed in red V neck jumpers and white shirts black slacks and did I seen all these lads walking around in leather jackets and cowboy boots and stuff I thought what the bloody hell is, what's going on here <laughs> it's like, and then we did our spot playing shadow stuff uh, don't worry Bruce I won't have a go with you <laughs> <laughs> all the shadow stuff and um, you haven't got my mate yeah <laughs> so um, we came off and they came on and they were everyone was dancing when we were on and when they came on everyone stopped and walked towards the stage and watched. I thought there's something, something happening here, you know. Yeah. That was when there was five of them, when Stuart was on base. No, it was a bit different for me because I didn't meet them till the end of '62. I was still with Cliff Bennett at the time. We were at the on the stage, mm. and uh, Adrian Barber, who was handling the sound there by that time, and Leonard had given him a an acetate, a demo of Please Please Me, which they'd just recorded before they came out. And he put it on the Tannoy. And whereas Love Me Do, you thought, oh, it's OK record. No. It got to number seven, nothing special. Please Please Me came on from the opening bar. I thought, bloody hell, that's a hit if ever I heard of it. It was stunning. But I still never thought they'd change the world like they did. I can't, I can't claim that I ever imagined it was going to be... I just thought they're going to have a good time and have some hit records. But it was way no, I, beyond I could I have I thought imagined. it was special. Because I play with them most every day. Oh, John, every night. and I thought you were special yeah. as well. Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, you, are. Uh, you, you can <laughs> tell. They had something, each individual had something. Paul 
was the like I'm, I'm amazing. Pete Best, I don't know the people remember Pete. Pete yeah, the drummer, but he was a handsome bloke, and all the ladies liked him. <laughs> and that, I think that's one of the reasons he got shut of him. I think mm, probably. <laughs> but Pete was, and he's and he's a nice lad as well. He's still alive. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, good luck with the tour, guys. And uh, thank you thank very you. much. It's going to be great. We get up to Scotland this time. They've been Mark moaning Ida about all the details on the website, right? All yeah. the details are on the website and various. Just, just um, you don't have to look for our website. Just punch in searches 24, 2024 dates and the links will come up. It's That's the easiest way to describe it. Brilliant stuff, guys. Thanks ever so much for coming in. All right. Well, thank You're you welcome. for having us. Yeah, good. Cheers and good, good luck with it all. This is gold.